Let us continue our discussion on reflexivity in visual ethnography. In our last section, we said that to be reflexive in visual ethnography means to be aware of the meanings that our images convey. To be aware of the meaning associated with our chosen visual medium and to be conscious of our role in the context. We have discussed the first one. Now we come to the second, which is about the meanings associated with our chosen medium. Is the representation a true copy of what it depicts? Or is it an improved, idealized version? Is an embellished image a false image? Or is it an artistic presentation of something that is otherwise ordinary? Most forms of visual art and representation have always held this tension between the real and the ideal or abstract. And perhaps this tension is most pronounced in the case of photography. The McDougall's film, Photo Wallas, explores this. One of the participants in the film is a wedding photographer who is trying to take pictures of a young woman that will be sent to prospective grooms by her family. As you are seeing this picture here, this is the picture of my sister Shushila and Das, and it it been taken by me. And uh, after taking this picture, we have sent this picture to the boy's family. So after they have seen this picture, so she been selected with this picture. And uh, here now you are seeing the picture of the same girl, which is my sister Shushila. Now she calls Shushila Saini with uh, with her husband, Mr. Vijay Saini. And this is a picture of uh, their, after their marriage. And here is the picture of a doctor. It's sent by to this, uh, this family, as you're seeing two girls in this picture. So they have got this picture from this doctor's side, and now they have to send uh, the one picture from the girl's side. So I got an appointment from this family now for this engagement picture. So. Probably next week I'm going to take the picture of this girl, this one. Uh, and uh, this is the sister of this girl, the second one. So actually they are bo both want to get married now. <laughs> mm, yes, smile. Peek. No, no, better. आप इधर आ जाओ है ना ताकि पता चल जाए कि टीवी ये लड़की है बस ठीक है हाँ उसका तब वो टीवी का इंतजाम नहीं करना पड़ेगा ना उसका तुम आल तुम पूरा ही दहेज का दिखा रहे नहीं नहीं मतलब कहने का ऐसा नहीं है कहने का आर्थ हाँ कहने का आर्थ है ना इसलिए तुमने पहले ही रखा आज ठीक हाँ As you see that it used to be like that when the in the past time when the people used to prefer the studio photographs. It is taken by the good lights and uh, different sort of touching on it. But uh, that would be all right uh, just for seeing, if you're seeing just the picture only. But uh, in the real way, when you'll see the person who is on the photograph, so then you will come to the, know the real story of what's in it. And I have seen one black and white picture with one girl, which she got from the boy's family. And uh, he was looking very nice in that picture, uh, with uh, just so smart and but when he came in front of that girl, so it was very uh, embarrassing for that girl. Even she could not talk to him. She wasn't feeling very nice to talk to him. And she just came from one door and she <laughs> ran from another door. Because uh, the, picture, uh, the picture was saying something else in that picture, but the person was not like that.
We see in the sequence, and the photographer says it quite well, that a photograph is expected to show a more desirable version of reality. But if it departs too much from the real, it fails its purpose. There is a careful balance or rather a tension between how real and how idealized a photograph should be. Speaking of this tension inherent in photography through the work of the wedding photographer, David McDougall has said, Even though he tries to show the women at their best, amidst signs of their affluence and sophistication, he is careful not to idealize them too much, because he knows that the couple will probably meet. Then it will be discovered what they really look like. If he idealizes too much, the photographs will fail as evidence. This tension between the constructed nature of a photograph and the reality it presents is a recurring theme in the film. In another sequence, a group of photography enthusiasts discuss this tension in their own work. They are not under obligation to present an idealized reality like the wedding photographer. Yet, the same tension between the ideal and the real exists for them when it comes to representing reality or beauty. मैं पकड़ू आन के आपको आप मुझे क्या पकड़े You take up landscape. Everyone cannot afford the painting. <laughs> if he asks two thousand rupees for one painting, a common man on the street cannot afford the painting. He will go in for a photograph only. <laughs> the same photograph I'll make for five hundred rupees, four hundred rupees. It depends on me. There are. Any Tom, Dick, and Harry can be a photographer. A photographer who wants to become a real artist, then it has to be one in thousand. It is not that easy just but to taking because technique has improved a lot. Instrumentation is very good. Nothing is out of focus, and everything is there. You can eliminate, do whatever you like. You can have some techniques developed which can change a photograph, but not completely out of place. It requires a lot of experimentation. So I don't agree. You go to any salon. I bet there is one or two which looks like what they have taken, but all has been <coughs> rendered in the dark room or at the time of printing, <coughs> or copied, recopied, enlarged, played in the dark room, solarization, and all those things are done. You can have a photograph much more yeah, beautiful yeah. than the reality. Mm, photo is al always uh, beautiful <laughs> than the original scene because you know the reason. You have selected. A good spot. Whereas when you go, a person may see that spot. He sees it as a whole, and then. But there are certain limits, which are not acceptable in photography, while they are very much acceptable in painting. So if we want to have a, a difference of the two, then really, that would make the difference. Yesterday I showed a one slide to my colleagues. I took six slides to copy it to make one. <laughs> so I don't believe it. Uh, neither I never believe it that photography is a normal presentation of the truth. But I think as long as it is real, the beauty should ex extend up to the real realism, not beyond that. Through a discussion of this tension, the photographers emphasize that a photograph is not simply captured, 
but is made. It is constructed. For many years and across cultures, this is what visual arts and photography have done. Represent people as they want to be seen, as they want to be remembered by others. You can see an example of this in the ethnographic film Future Remembrance by Tobias Wendel and Nancy Duplessis, set in Ghana in the 1990s. The film explores various forms through which people are visually represented in Ghanaian culture. Photographs, painted portraits, and funeral statues. In each of these, people ask the artist to depict them as they are and as they aspire to be. The reality that an image constructs is made up of both these aspects. Its constructed nature reminds us that an image, like all forms of representation, is subjective. It usually presents the perspective of the maker. Reflecting on this subjectivity can reveal our ways of seeing and those of our participants. This is a point that Christopher Pinney makes as he recounts an incident from the early part of his career as an anthropologist. In the early years of his field work in India, Pinney took a photograph of his neighbor, the kind of ethnographic image that he wanted to produce. Candid, revealing, expressive of the people I was living among. The photograph was half length and showed his participant standing in the fields in the evening hours. His participant, however, did not like the picture at all. Pinney says that he complained about the shadow and darkness cast over his face and the absence of the lower half of his body. The photograph that he wanted instead required preparation. Clothes to be changed, hair to be brushed and oiled, and in the case of upper caste women, the application of talcum powder to lighten the skin. And it had to be framed in a particular way. It had to be full length and symmetrical with expressionless faces and body poses. In short, the photograph that his participant wanted was a typical studio photograph. To Pinney, this kind of picture was the antithesis of an ethnographic image. According to him, an ethnographic image should show the participants in their natural context, engaging in activities that form their daily lives. How could a post-studio style photograph be ethnographic? The photograph that Pinney first took and the one that his participant wanted were defined by the difference in their cultures and ways of seeing. Pinney's idea was influenced by the realist documentary style that ethnographers value. The participants' ideas were based on the conventions of studio photography familiar in his culture. These two different photographs represent the subjectivities of the researcher and the participant. An important part of being reflexive is to be aware of these subjectivities, our own and that of our participants. We must attempt to create ethnographies that are an outcome of the interaction between the subjectivities of the researcher and the participant. In other terms, our ethnographies must be intersubjective in nature. What does this mean in terms of visual ethnography? Let us return to Pinney to understand that. The photograph that he finally took was as per the directions of his participant. It matched the conventions of studio photography, but it was also a record of the researcher's engagement with his participant. Thus, the image represented the interaction between two different ways of seeing. It was a record created through the coming together of two subjectivities, Pinis and his participants. And it represented the interaction of two visual cultures, modern anthropology and Indian studio photography. By admitting such intersubjectivity into his work, Pini learned a little more about his participant and the notions of self-representation in his culture. He also learned something about his own practice and the ways of seeing that defined his discipline. Pini's experience brings home one more point with regards to reflexivity. To be reflexive means to be aware of our role and location in the context and the expectations of our participants. 
We may see ourselves as researchers in the world of the other, but how are we perceived by the other? What are their expectations from us? What roles have they assigned to us? Recall our discussion on access and the role of the ethnographer. Sometimes, even when our role as professional researcher is overt, we are assigned another role by our participant community. They could assign us the role of documenters of their lives and worlds, apprentices and learners, fellow travelers, and even friends and confidants. They are likely to have certain expectations of us as per the roles assigned, and these expectations extend to the records that we make of their world. They may want these records to portray a particular aspect of their lives or to serve a function. Sarah Pink's participants, for instance, wanted her to take pictures which they could keep as personal records and share with family and friends. Rani Ben and Megi Ben wanted a record of their personal narratives that would reach a larger audience. An awareness of these expectations and how our records and representations fulfill them is important. It helps us answer some of the questions that we begin our research with. What is the objective served by the research? And how does our research impact our participants and their community? And so it helps to remain true to the objectives we had started out with. And it helps us understand a little more about how our participants perceive certain forms of visual representation. In the examples that we have shared in this section, researchers explore how their visual medium and the representations they create were perceived by their participants. In the process, they became aware of their own ways of seeing. This led them to reflect on the media they use, whether it is photography, film, or animation. They learned about the meanings associated with their chosen medium. And they discovered that participants have a say in how they want to be represented. That participants often assert their agency by defining the terms of representation. So to be respectful of how the other wants to be represented is an important part of the ethnographer's responsibility. To summarize, to be reflexive means to be aware of our intentionality in making an image. It means to be conscious of subjective ways of seeing and to attempt intersubjectivity in our representations. And it means to be conscious of the implications of our representations on the lives of our participants. This kind of reflexivity is essential if we are to move from using images as illustrations or as substitutes for words, and if we want our research to be truly collaborative and participatory. For those of you who want to further explore what an image or a visual representation means, we have an exercise. We would like you to watch the film Future Remembrance by Tobias Mendel and Nancy Duplessis. Based on your understanding of the film, answer a few questions on the meanings associated with photography and memory in Ghanaian culture.